Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled Electromobility Technical Solutions for System Integration. We are grateful to our moderator, Dr. Christoph Bonnery, and our distinguished panelists for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience, and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations along with a host of other products and services that you can find on our website at www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our moderator. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have any questions for the panelists, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window and type your question. We kindly request that you do not send your questions by email. We've allocated plenty of time at the end of the webinar to address your questions. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Christoph Bonnery from Indias, to lead this webinar. Christoph, over to you. Thank you, thank you, David. Good morning, good, af good afternoon to depending on the place you are located in the world. Welcome to this webinar. This webinar will talk about electromobility and uh, the, we are going to uh, address different topics of the uh, electromobility. Uh, not all the topics, but I hope that you will, come, you will find uh, interesting ideas. So we, we have the chance to have today five speakers and um, the, the rule is that uh, they have about uh, 15 to maximum 20 minutes, and I will uh, show my hand to, to ask you to, to stop uh, before you, you come to the end. The idea is to have a question, a uh, five minute question maximum at the, at the end of each presentation, I mean, understanding questions. And, um, and then uh, we will have more questions at the end, uh, 15 minutes if we have the time to continue the discussion. We have the chance to, to be joined by uh, Yannick Perez now, who is on the screen, and we can say one or two minutes of word uh, if you wish. Okay, thank you, uh, Christophe, uh, for um, having launched the session. Uh, I have mixed up the different um, things, uh, but uh, I have prepared five slides to, to make the introduction of, of the webinar, so I, I'm going to try to, um, to display them. Uh, so here we go. So um, today we are going to, to speak about uh, system integration of uh, electric vehicle uh, and with a focus on, the, on the, the, the joint work between mobility on the one hand and uh, electricity system on, on the other hand. And I think it's uh, good to, to, to start with uh, an introduction to, to see how the two uh, mobility and energy are more interlinked and mesh than before. Uh, and uh, just to let you, uh, uh, to, to give you a flower of uh, this uh, need of study both of them together, it's because today mobility is mostly privately owned by people which are driving cars. Uh, it's a source of polluting sources of emissions. It raises congestions uh, on urban areas. Uh, it generates no noise pollution. Uh, it induces uh, an overuse of public space for car parks. It's killing or injuring drivers, passengers, and pedestrians. And today we face uh, a very little use of car sharing mobility services for pulling and trying to reduce uh, this uh, role of mobility in uh, today's life. So the actual business model of mobility is very clear. It's mainly privately owned uh, with no internalization of uh, the main issues uh, that I have listed here. But we must explore three innovations that have potential to uh, solve most of these problems. 
The first one is, of course, the electric car, and the session is devoted uh, to this uh, question mainly, because it will raise uh, solutions to uh, noise reduction, local emission reduction, and global emission reduction if the electricity or the hydrogen are coming from uh, renewable energies. The sharing economy is also a good solution because it uh, helps to reduce uh, urban congestion. Most of this shows that uh, one shared car could replace between four to 15 cars, depending on the places these cars are, uh, are used. And of course, it, uh, it has a good impact on the cost reduction per kilometer for passengers if the car is shared. And then the last one is, of course, the autonomous cars because they can uh, run all the time. Uh, it's a non-stop services and uh, they, are, they seem to have uh, less impact in terms of accident, even if uh, there is an unclear liability rules in case of accident. And the idea of today is to look at uh, what are the possible combination between EVs, shared and autonomous cars. Of course, there is a lot of open questions and today we are going to focus on technical solution for system integration between EVs and energy system in this focus. So I will act as a moderator, trying to uh, keep the time, the timing. Uh, we will have uh, four very good speakers, uh, Rémi, Emilia, Icaro, and then uh, Christophe to uh, make the conclusion. And uh, I give the floors uh, to Rémi, uh, that now he could introduce himself and uh, explain us how he's seeing mobility and energy uh, from his point of view. I mean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yannick. So, um, okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for being with us. Um, I am very pleased to present uh, this uh, research work uh, conducted with Axel Ludreau at the Vedicom Institute. Uh, concerning an observatory of new mobility offers and giving some methodological insight and the work in progress towards the French, uh, French application. Um, Vedicom is a research institute um, dedicated to decarbonize the connected and shared mobility. So this is the outline of the presentation. What were our motivations for this research? Well, these are some um, context um, elements. First of all, we can notice a, a sort of stability of the model share of public transport in large European cities, even with an occasional increase in car use, such as noted by the survey by Kronos uh, Lopsoko two years ago. Second, uh, we can act the end of the historical opposition between private car and public transport through the development of shared mobility, which now raises the question, is car the public transportation of tomorrow? The third point is that uh, inclusive mobility is no part of national and local transport policy, um, like uh, the indications uh, of the French mobility orientation law uh, in December last year. Inclusive mobility, that is to say mobility for everyone, independently of your age, physical abilities, gender, income, and in every territory from central cities to low densely populated areas. <clears throat> last, mobility as a service is now the challenge of intelligent transportation systems uh, dedicated to highly connected users. Uh, early adopters express, indeed, a breakdown in travel demand, for example, uh, through private hire practices, for example, through real-time carpooling practices. And this breakdown is to be compared to single occupant car use uh, via the use of mobility apps. Last, the automotive industries is now engaged in a switch from a business model of exclusive good production to innovative mobility offers, uh, which are um, dedicated to uh, be integrated in a mobility as a service system. Here we can see the rapidly evolving mobility pattern. At the left of the figure, 
uh, you should consider all that is related to private car uh, for individual or shared trips, either as a single occupant car use or ride sharing. At the right of the figure, you should consider non-private car in the sense of uh, you have an individual or shared use of a mode, not a trip, but a mode, and this cancels uh, mobility categories such as car sharing, taxi private hire, or on-demand transport. And last, at the top of the graph, uh, you should consider alternative modes to car, uh, such as public transport, active mode, um, including walking, cycling, and now micro-mobility objects. Okay. All these uh, pattern aims to uh, achieve sustainability goals of mobility policies, economic ones, transport costs, environmental ones for the ecological transition, and social one, trip optimization and valuation. And what is here interesting is that uh, some uh, certain mobility offers and uh, are in between two poles, you can see it at the bottom of the graphic for conventional ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars. This is all the more true for electric cars and self-driving cars will be either uh, owned or shared as transport modes. So what was the research question around this project? Um, we adopted the user-centric approach first for the design of sustainable mobility policies. Uh, from the design demand side, we uh, were willing to have a finer understanding of the determinants for behavioral change, uh, leading to either psychological or economic incentive. Psychological incentives to model shifts, such as reliability, safety, convenience, and comfort are the mobility offers. Uh, which are the major drivers identified in the previous literature for model shift. Uh, regarding the economic incentives, road pricing and predictable emission quotas should be considered here. Second, from the supply side, we wanted to analyze eco-innovation in the design of new mobility offers and mobility apps and to solve or to, to bring some guidelines to to help solving business models, uh, precarious business models. Uh, you can have some example in France for redrive, for example, for short distance carpooling or car or bike sharing systems in medium sized cities in France or the failure, the well known failure in, of Autolib in Paris metropolitan area two years ago. Um, to get uh, more into details of the research question from the demand side, we wanted to identify the features of exclusive single occupant car drivers. Uh, what are the brakes to model shift toward public transport action mode and shared mobility? On the country, what are the features of the 100% inter or multimodal users, uh, namely the early adopters? How do they use multimodal apps and are there, uh, are there uh, characteristics uh, transferable to other groups of mobility users. From the supply side, the question was to design an innovative mobility offer to be implemented in the relevant market given specific mobility users in a local area and an offer um, that would be dedicated to integrate the local transport system. Last, we wanted to grow the conditions of economic durability for such innovative offers and to identify the role of local authorities in a, a form of new mobility governance, governance between private actors and uh, public authorities. The methodology. In this research, in this research, sorry, we uh, wanted to successfully, uh, successfully have first um, an observation, a systematic observ observation of emerging mobility offer. Second, we wanted to classify them through an um, evolving nomenclature. Third, this is the core of the research project, we uh, built an evaluation matrix 
which is based on 18 relevant criteria and measurement indicators. These criteria indicators were uh, proposed, discussed, and validated three years ago by an expert group in mobility, associating academics, um, industrials, and um, local authorities. And these criteria are aimed to um, represent the interests of various stakeholders groups, such as the mobility users themselves, historical act actors, again, automotive industry, but also insurance companies and maintenance companies, newcomers and startups, and public authorities, states, the state, and local authorities. Or we had to list the sources that were required for the assessment process, uh, namely institutional reports, studies and surveys, academic papers. We then had to select certain innovative mobility offers from the user's viewpoint. Uh, we also built a typology of areas associated to specific weighted schemes to be attributed to the 18 uh, criteria. We then processed effectively the assessment of the selected mobility offers, which gave us individual scores of the mobility, of, of the mobility offers and revealed some strengths and weaknesses for each mobility offer that, were, that was assessed. At the end, the aim was to highlight mobility offers of particular interest in certain types of area or in specific territories or areas. To do this, we relied on the decision aid support literature to build the evaluation matrix. We could um, trade off between a cost benefit analysis or a multi criteria decision analysis. Uh, CBA is used for long wing transport projects, including for uh, to assess light mobility offers for around uh, 10 years. Still, CBA does not respond to the diversity of qualitative factors that may characterize innovative mobility offer. So we, we chose instead to rely on a multi-criteria decision analysis uh, in the sense that MCDA uh, conversely allows to uh, jointly consider several criteria. Our methodological protocol was to consider the case of a mobility users only one, a single mobility user, which is about to make a non-defined trip alone in a conventional ICE car, and who decide to use an alternative mobility offer to do his trip, okay? And this mobility offer is to be assessed by the two. So mm -hmm. each selected mobility offer is therefore set in relation to this baseline, that is to say, again, ICE car used by a single occupant driver. Remy, you have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the multi criteria decision analysis. So here is a list of the 18 criteria indicators that were validated by the expert group in mobility. Uh, these criteria are based on the three pillars of sustainable development. I won't have time to get into details, but you have uh, for the first one economy two subgroups around uh, the manufacturer or supply factor. For example, for the manufacturer, the cost of the alternative mobility offer for the user are the time saving that uh, are allowed by the mobility user, uh, by this uh, mobility offer, sorry, uh, instead of the use of uh, your private car. Uh, for supply factor, for example, the share of public funding in the business model of the offer. The second group of criteria is quite classical uh, around the environmental issues, uh, JG abatement, uh, hair quality, noise exposure, road safety, for example. And the third one concerning social or societal aspects, dimensions, um, distinguishes between incentives for use and effective use of the alternative mobility offers. So, for example, the condition for local development of the offer, the personal of collective level to use the offer, and as far as the effective use is concerned, and the frequency of use and the satisfaction of use. So here you can uh, see a, a partial uh, table of the results for four mobility offers. Uh, for example, uh, the scores displayed here are given only for illustration. Okay, this is not the real score. Uh, 
For example, in the first column, electric car is assessed uh, for nine of the 18 criteria from A1 to B3, and the scores obtained for each criteria declined in measurement indicator goes from one to five. Um, jointly, we had to consider that the evaluation of a mobility offer is obvious, uh, doesn't obtain reach the same score, depending if you want to implement it in a very uh, highly dense populated area or in rural area. So we had also to build with another group of uh, territorial experts this time, namely local authority and uh, academic geographer, uh, a typology of area. Uh, that we could apply to Paris metropolitan area of uh, two of other French metropolises, okay? Uh, going from very uh, densely populated area, here in, in the example in red, Paris central city, in dark orange, uh, the inner suburb, red Paris, in light orange, the entire conurbation of Paris, and in green, the rest of the metropolitan area distinguishes between light green central municipalities uh, that benefit from a railway station uh, to, to go easily uh, towards uh, the greater Paris. And in dark green, the other municipality that don't benefit from railway station, so that can mainly rely on private car to uh, everyday tour. Okay. Here is an example of the results obtained after applying such um, weighting, uh, different weighting depending on the density of the territory. At the left of the figure, you have the more uh, densely populated area and to right it rural areas. So you can see here the dotted uh, gray line, which is uh, our baseline, uh, single occupant car, thermal car, ICE car, uh, which uh, obtained very poor uh, environmental result in dense areas at the left of the graph and uh, whose profile is uh, increasing with uh, as human uh, density decreases okay which is um, a totally um, opposite result that we obtain in dark blue with a single occupant car but electric car which conversely obtain high score in uh, dense areas because of environmental scores that are highly valued there and whose profile is decreasing this time as human density decreases, okay? Amy, one minute to conclude. Okay, to conclude. So the work in progress now uh, is to uh, collect territorial needs, for example, to uh, improve the mobility of new liberal users, uh, to integrate a, a new offer in a local transport system, or to identify which emerging offer best correspond to my territory. Uh, we already done this first step, the assessment on the basis of 18 criteria, and we know are willing to investigate uh, such um, additional topics with local authorities about prep definition, geographical features, socioeconomic features, and mobility gap. And I think I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Remy. Uh, perfect time control. Uh, we have um, three questions on, on the chat. Um, the first, uh, the first one is um, is already uh, answered uh, from Robert Fisher. Uh, where you, you explain that, uh, of course, uh, the, the private car will not be the public transport for tomorrow, but uh, only a part of it. Uh, the second question comes from Lucas uh, Kodeisa, we which is asking, uh, uh, can you share the 18 criteria uh, uh, that you have used uh, to frame the MCDA um, methodology you have used? And uh, the last one from uh, Adid uh, Moussavi. I'm sorry if I'm not spelling right the, <laughs> the names. Um, uh, is uh, is about uh, the impact on the sensitiveness uh, to hygiene uh, on the co um, on the public transport or on the car sharing uh, due to uh, the COVID crisis. 
are people who are going to use public transport or um, or um, or uh, shared cars if they are stressed about uh, COVID pandemic issues. Okay. Um... So, yes, concerning the 18 criteria used to frame the NCDA, um, this part of the work has been published in Transport Policy uh, one year ago. So, um, uh, a post-press version of the, of the paper is available and uh, I, can share, I can share it uh, uh, if needed uh, with uh, great pleasure. Uh, concerning the second uh, question, actually, Velikom, um, <laughs> It's a very good audience to uh, to say this, but uh, Velikom is just uh, launching uh, a survey uh, to know um, to to collect the experience of um, mobility during the lockdown peri uh, period in France, and to consider the way um, mobility patterns or mobility behavior to be affected uh, now that uh, French people could. Uh, progressively go out uh, from uh, next uh, Monday. So, um, obviously, the, um, there is a huge uh, risk of um, uh, increasing uh, car, private car use um, uh, as far as uh, public transportation uh, are not the best, uh, the more convenient option to, uh, to move uh, in this uh, in those time um, so and shared mobility in the form of carpooling or for other reason car sharing is uh, should also be affected so um, what happens in france and i think in uh, many other countries is that uh, maybe uh, cycling would be the uh, the winner of the situation and um, that uh, will be confirmed uh, in a very few days in, the, in France. Uh, but yeah. we, it's, yes, we, we have some negative consequences on public transportation and probably on shared mobility for months and months, I think. Okay. Uh, a last question from uh, Michael Grossman. Um, how are the dimensions in the multi-criteria weighted to arrive to this composite score? It's more a technical question. How do you have weighted uh, the 18th element to end up in the score, um, one, two, three, four, or whatsoever score is it? Um, um, I, I can't uh, consider if the question is about uh, territorial weighting or... Uh, it's if it's territorial, we mm, we propose to to weight not each of the eighteen uh, criteria, but by some group of three, um, dividing economy, environmental, and uh, social criteria. Uh, no, it's a territorial weighting. It's within each territory. Yes. Okay. So uh, what I can say here that. Um, was not easy to um, define a very precise uh, threshold between one, two, three, four, and five for each indicator, if that is a question, because the sources for the assessment are not synonymous, uh, notably as far as you consider uh, one mobility offer alone in a category. For example, you don't assess a carpooling, you assess blah, blah, car, in the carpooling category or Claxit in the carpooling category. So the sources are not synonymous. So um, that was not an easy task to define the thresholds. They couldn't be too, uh, too sensitive. Okay, for example, uh, to measure the decrease in uh, air pollution, we have a quite large threshold saying uh, between zero and minus 20 percent, between minus 20 and min minus 40 percent, minus 40 and minus 60, you know, it's not, uh, it's not uh, zero, minus two, minus two, minus four, it's more large, larger than that. So, uh, because we do not want to achieve a very precise core for each uh, solution, but we, what we are willing to do is the more understandable and uh, 
mobilizable uh, comparison with our baseline solution, we see it again, um, single occupancy, uh, single occupier, occupant car use. Thank you very much uh, for, for the answers, uh, Remy. Uh, now we are going to, uh, to go for the, the second uh, speech of uh, Emilia. So Emilia, the, the floor is yours and the computer as well. Okay, so good afternoon to everyone from Paris. Thank you for the presentation, Yannick. Um, so I hope you can see my screen okay. Uh, so we've already talked about the crisis. So um, today um, I would like to talk a bit about happier times when you could still make long distance trips, uh, notably to go on a holiday. So, uh, so I would like to talk to you today uh, about the work we've been doing on long distance mobility with EVs and particularly on the charging infrastructure that would be required on intercity highway corridors. Okay, so as you might know, uh, long distance trips are really the major concern for EV manufacturers. Uh, so if we want EV owners to be able to make long distance trips, uh, we will need to equip highways with charging infrastructure. Uh, this, however, poses a few issues, um, notably because uh, this fast charging infrastructure is actually quite expensive uh, and it also has a big impact on the electric grid. So maybe Christoph will tell us more about this grid side. Um, secondly, uh, the sizing of this charging infrastructure uh, would need to be based on peak uh, traffic periods, such as the holiday periods. Uh, which would mean that this infrastructure would be oversized and underutilized uh, much of the rest of the year. Uh, also, uh, the so-called fast charging uh, can still take quite a long while, uh, especially if you have an EV with a small battery, so a more environmentally friendly EV, let's say. And of course, you can also have issues such as queues, uh, different technical difficulties, and so on. Uh, so given all these disadvantages uh, to fast charging infrastructure, uh, we might ask uh, whether there are not any feasible alternatives and how would these alternatives compare to fast charging, uh, notably in terms of cost? So one potential alternative are the so-called electric road systems. Uh, so there are different experimentations in this field actually all over the globe, so from the States uh, to Korea, to uh, Sweden, uh, to Germany. Um, but, um, uh, and there are also different technologies uh, that are under uh, development here. So you have conductive charging using either catenaries or rails, uh, that's mostly for trucks. But you also have things like uh, wireless dynamic charging uh, that might be used for cars. And Vedicom is actually also developing a prototype for a wireless charging, uh, wireless dynamic charging system. So that's why our work is also focused on this type of technology. So you can see uh, one illustration here. So uh, the point, uh, the key uh, of this type of technology is that uh, the charging system would be integrated into the road surface uh, in the form of a charging lane. And so this would allow EV users to charge their vehicles while driving, so without any need to stop the charge. Okay, so in our modeling work, um, we've actually started from the premise uh, that the public powers would want to equip highways with charging infrastructure uh, in order to facilitate the large-scale deployment of electric mobility. Uh, and we've also uh, considered that these highways would be operated by private actors, as is the case here in France. So for these private investors, of course, the question is, uh, in which type of infrastructure should I invest uh, and how much would this cost? Um, however, uh, we also uh, suppose that this cost would be ultimately transferred to the users of this system. So from the user perspective, uh, we might ask uh, how much uh, is the charging fee? 
And of course, you might also look at things like comfort uh, that Amy just mentioned earlier. And uh, just, uh, just note that uh, the, our work here is mainly focused uh, on cars, so we really haven't really taken trucks into consideration uh, yet anyways. Uh, so we basically built a, a fairly simple model uh, for a generic highway corridor and we've modeled two scenarios. So one uh, scenario with fast charging stations deployed from 2025 to 2015 and the second scenario uh, where you have this inductive lane uh, that comes into the market in 2030 and so gets uh, deployed on the highways from 2030 on. And of course, this type of modeling work involves a lot of different hypotheses. Uh, so uh, you notably have uh, the traffic uh, or the flow of vehicles on this highway corridor. Uh, you have the percentage of EVs, uh, the compatibility with induction, uh, the average speed and the consumption per kilometer. Uh, for the charging stations, you have the installation, equipment, maintenance costs. Uh, but also the lifetimes, failure rates, uh, and efficiency of the chargers. Uh, the same also for the charging lane, of course. And in addition, you have different uh, economic parameters, such as discount rates, uh, electricity price, uh, different learning curves, and so on. And of course, you also have the length of the highway section, uh, the distance of the charging stations, and so on. So here we've considered a section of uh, 200 kilometers. So sorry, not in miles for Americans. Um, and I, I would just like to note here that there was actually a paper that was published in the World Electric Vehicle Journal last October, I think. Uh, so if you're interested really in the model details, uh, you can have a look at that paper as well. Uh, although the parameter values that we cite there are a bit outdated, so we updated them for this latest work. Um, however, we quickly uh, came across a major issue uh, in this work, uh, which is that the uh, cost and the characteristics of the inductive technology are quite uncertain, uh, as this technology is still very much on the development. So the cost could be anywhere from, uh, from like half a million uh, euros or dollars per lane kilometer uh, up to five million per lane kilometer. But I'll go straight into the interesting bit of the results of the work. Uh, so you can basically see here, see here sorry, the evolution of the net present value uh, of this infrastructure uh, over time. So so basically you have the charging station scenario in blue that you might see here and then you have the different variants of the inductive uh, lane scenario uh, in darker shades of red uh, according to the cost hypothesis. Uh, and so you can actually see that there's a big dip uh, in the cost in 2030 when this inductive uh, lane is first installed. Uh, and also another big tip in 2040, uh, when we suppose that the system uh, needs to be renewed for the first time. Uh, and you can actually see here that this uh, inductive uh, technology would indeed be quite a lot uh, more expensive than the charging stations. So the cost could be anywhere from uh, like 1.6 times to 11 times more expensive. Oh, sorry. Um, however, uh, we might also ask whether users would not be willing to pay more for using this inductive charging uh, as it is vastly, uh, vastly superior to charging stations in terms of comfort uh, and also the gains in terms of time. So from a user perspective, uh, when we take uh, when we take the, the uh, charging fee that would be paid by the users in case of fast charging that you can see as a blue line here and we add to this charging fee uh, the value of time that they would need to uh, lose charging their vehicle so we get this light, lighter blue line. We can actually see that uh, when you take into account the true cost of fast charging uh, we actually get quite close to the most expensive uh, inductive lane scenario. So perhaps from a user perspective, uh, this inductive lane technology might be quite interesting, although it is still more costly to, to install. Five minutes, Emilia. Okay. 
so um, I, I've already talked a bit about the uncertainty um, uh, regarding the cost and the characteristics of the inductive lanes. Um, however, there is of course also a big uncertainty um, around the failure rates and also the lifetime of this nice polar technology. And of course, uh, there is a major uncertainty on the number of EVs that will be on future highways and also on the compatibility with inductive technology. Um, however, so in addition to looking at uncertainties, um, we might ask uh, which parameters actually have the biggest impact on the results. And interestingly, uh, we can actually see that for the inductive lanes, uh, the speed of the vehicles and, and the related energy consumption per kilometer uh, is actually a very crucial parameter. Uh, so it would seem that it would be, would be interesting to equip sections where the speed, speeds are actually quite low uh, and the energy consumption is low as well. So I'm um, getting to the conclusion, so four points. Uh, first of all, uh, inductive lanes are indeed uh, more expensive uh, than fast charging. Uh, but as I've said, there are major uncertainties as to the costs and characteristics of this technology. Um, however, uh, if we take the value of time into account, uh, inductive lanes might actually be much more appealing to the users or drivers. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, the speed and the energy consumption per kilometer are really a crucial parameter uh, when we are sizing and choosing locations for these inductive lanes. And lastly, uh, of course, there's a big drawback to this inductive lane technology, uh, which is that it cannot be uh, deployed in a gradual manner in the, same, uh, in the same manner as you can add charging points, but you need to deploy it in a one-off manner. Uh, so, uh, our next step would be uh, to uh, develop a more detailed and realistic version of this model, um, as we would very much like to do a real-life case study for a highway system, so either the French highway system uh, or some other highway system. Uh, so, if you're interested in uh, partnering with Pedecom and uh, getting involved in uh, getting access to that future work, uh, please get in touch with me. So just to end on a bit of a twist ending, so uh, we've talked here of extremely expensive uh, fixed infrastructure. Um, however, uh, we might also wonder if there are not other more flexible and cost effective, uh, uh, cost efficient alternatives. And notably something that would allow uh, EVs with small batteries to make long distance trips. So we've actually studied one such uh, solution from a French startup that you can see here. Uh, but I'll hope to talk about that maybe in a future webinar. So thank you. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Emilia. Um, there is uh, one question from uh, Michael Grossman uh about uh, the um health effects the possible health effects of uh, wireless charging on people around and on people with uh, metal implants or price makers um, uh, due to uh, electromagnetic waves yes that's that's a very good question um i think that's something that's not studied at Vedicom, unfortunately not at the moment but it's true that that's a major concern for the inductive technology. And then there is two questions for, from Mawan um, Taufiki, but I don't see the questions in the, in, the, uh, in the chat, so I don't know what the questions are. I just uh, see the questions. I, I think I see the questions. So there's a question about 2030 projections. Um, so we, we've based the number of EVs on, well, uh, kind of a medium uh, value of different French projections. So you can find that in the, the paper in the World Electric Vehicle Journal. Um, but we've considered actually here that the, the number of EVs increases in a linear manner, uh, which is perhaps a bit conservative actually. So, but of course, this is something we don't really know how it's going to develop, so it's difficult to determine. 
And I see just another question on hydrogen cars as alternative to, to EVs. Um, this is, of course, a good point, and uh, we actually wanted to try to compare the cost of uh, hydrogen uh, technology to this uh, charging infrastructure, but, uh, but unfortunately we haven't been able to do that. Um, however, uh, if, um, if I believe the, the car manufacturers that are members of Vedecom, so French car manufacturer companies, uh, they seem to be saying that uh, hydrogen is still a much further away in the development chain than uh, electric cars, so, so it's not for today, as electric cars are already on the market and we can, uh, and they can be part of the decarbonized mobility from now on. Thank you. Uh, so, Christophe, do you want to, to follow up or uh, Icaro? What? Christophe, your mic is switched off. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, thank you for, for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. So I, as, I, as it was said, I will give the, the message of uh, uh, a French distribution system operator. Uh, I, I, I am, uh, some people know me as an as a executive vice president from the association, but here I talk about with my hat of uh, director for economics and prospective, and the distribution system operator has to wonder on what will impact in the future the, the, the grid and the investment. So typically, the, the electric vehicles are, are impacted. So I will uh, uh, show you my presentation now. Um, okay. Okay, here it is. So, uh, so we are going to assess in this presentation the impact of a massive development of electric vehicles on the real existing network, which is the case of France. And uh, we are using a model that we have developed, which is named the gravity-based model, to see the impact on the 2,000 substations existing on the, on the, on the uh, actual uh, uh, grid in France. So uh, NED, for those who don't know it, is uh, in, for in unbundled market. Unbundling means that we have segmenting the value chain of electricity, as you all know, in generation, transmission, distribution, and supply of power. And NED is dealing with the issue of, of distributing power. We are quite a monopoly, as we are serving 95% of the French customers. Uh, we, uh, to, to finish in one minute the presentation, we are generating 14 million 14 billion euro revenue. Uh, we are investing every year 4 billion euro, so we have to invest it in the good direction, depending on who will develop first. And we are serving 35, 37 million customers. So this, uh, gr this graph is showing you that uh, electric vehicles are directly plugged to the distribution grid. We have other topics which are uh, items from the from uh, energy um, energy transition, which are connected to the distribution grid. We have the uh, renewable uh, uh, renewable sources. We have also the batteries. We have also the new behavior of prosumers, which will be uh, facilitated by smart meters and by the management of the big data coming from these smart meters. But we focus today on only one. Which is um, if I can do, uh, which is uh, the electric vehicles. Um, if I want to comp to to make a small comparison, uh, let's compare France to the United States in terms of uh, fleet of electric vehicles to 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 size the effect and the impact of the uh, of the ambition of the French government to develop electric vehicles. Uh, in a population of 68 million people with a fleet of 30 million vehicles, the target of the government is to go to up to 15 million vehicles. The equivalent in the, in the US with the three, uh, 327 million people would be to have 140 million vehicles in the, in, the, in the grid and to make sure that the uh, distribution operators, in, uh, power distribution operators in the, in the country 
will not lead the country to a blackout, which we want to avoid also in France. This is to give you the impact, the, the size effect of what we are going to do. And to show that um, the, the plan of the government is to, uh, as you can see on these four colors, which are the uh, scenarios that we are developing in, in Edis, we are um, targeting to, to, uh, to, uh, to have in 2035, between 3 million at minimum and 15 million electric vehicles uh, running, uh, uh, running, uh, running on the um, French roads. So what is sizing for uh, DSO is not only the energy trans transported, but it's also, it is the peak generated by the demand. And so we have to, to, to measure here the peak uh, which that we will have in 2035 generated from electric vehicles, but also from other, other uh, segments or other sectors. This, this, this group of, uh, of bars is showing on the left one, I, don't, I hope you can see my mouse. Uh, on the left one, it is the present situation. We are today, the resi residential sector is generating 50 gigawatts on the, uh, of demand on the, on the grid. And the, on the bar beside that are, the, are four scenarios, which are all, as you can see, de decreasing so in 2035. So they are, and this shows that the, due to for mainly uh, energy efficiency, the, dim, the peaking demand will decrease in, uh, in 2035. In the opposite, the, ter the service sector uh, is slightly increasing in the future. The industry is uh, increasing a little bit. Agriculture is flat, but the transport is rising. It is due essentially to electric vehicle with the four scenario I have presented before. But of course, all this uh, energy, uh, all this power is not required at the same hour of the, of the year. So at the end, if we want to see all sector combined in, uh, in 2035, one can see that still there will, there will be in some scenario an increase, or which, which means for us, uh, in industry and investment in the grid. And this is the case if we don't control the loading of the electric cars. If we fully control the, the loading and place them at the better hours, you can see here that uh, in, the, in the contrary, the, the peak demand in 2035, which are the four left, uh, four right bars here, is decreasing. So this is what we are going to do. Um, and uh, this is uh, what one point. The second is um, the fact that uh, uh, we, so we need to, to uh, measure uh, another thing, which is the, um, the need for travel. And we don't know that, believe it or not, we don't know how many people are running from one, one uh, municipality A to municipality B. And we, if how many travel this generates in France today? Be, and we need to know how many travels are made, how many kilometers, how many energy has to be filled in the tanks of the electric cars to compute and to know how much, uh, what will be the load in the actual uh, system. So I show you a very small, gra small graph of the model, uh, which is showing that we need to know, to assess first the car travel needs. This is what I'm going to show now. We will have some assumption for the electric uh, vehicle uh, diffusion rates and for the behavior of, um, of uh, users of this, this one. So if I go now to uh, the travel computation needs, travel need computation, uh, I can I, I explain you in one slide how this gravity-based model is working. We suppose that cities, or we can do that for, for uh, working travel or for uh, leisure tra travel. Supposing you are located in one city town, which is town A, you want, do, do, will you travel in, in your own city or will you travel to city, to city B or to, to city C? So we take the example of three cities, one of 1,000 people, uh, town A, town B, 100 people, and town C, 10,000 10, people. And what is important for the decision-making process is not the distance, but it's the time to go from time A, a B, and C. And so you have on the graph, the, the time to go from, from A to B is 10 minutes in this assumption. Uh, from town, town B to C is uh, 20 minutes and 30 minutes between time B, town B 
towns A and town C. The, the model is, uh, uh, gives the following result. If we are, uh, the town A will monopolize uh, about 80 travels out of the 1,000 that could be made because it has a critical size, but still 200 people are attracted by town C because it is a larger city, because of the, of the gravity effect of the of, of city C, they will be attracted in, even if it is uh, 30 minutes away from, some, from town A. We, we will have 200 uh, travel to this to this city, and only very few are going to town to town B because it is smaller uh, and, and and so less attractive. For instance, less cinemas, less shops, less thing to do. So they will, they will remain in town A, and we do that for the three cities. For town B is attracting is not a lot itself, so it 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 it, it generates six travels, but town A generates. Uh, 40 travels and town C for, uh, 53 with a, du du with a dual effect, which is it is closer for town A, but uh, but it is bigger for town C. So there are, uh, there is a uh, an arbitrage to uh, to make between these three cities. And and town, if you look at town C, it is very much attracting the other city, uh, the its own the citizen, and uh, very, uh, there are very few the tra travel outside this. So here you have three cities. In France, we have 36,000 municipalities. So we have computed that for uh, all these municipalities. And uh, this generates, uh, for, as we can measure, for uh, leisure and for working travel, 2 billion potential flows that we have computed. Then we have the map of France. And here you have some cities. And what is important is what I said, is not the distance between the cities, but it is the time to go from city A to city B. If it is behind the mountain, it will take more time. So we have taken a Google Maps uh, system and we have, measure, and we have uh, made a big matrix on how much time it takes to go from town A to town B and you have a very big uh, uh, thing to come to. So from that, we know the need of, of, uh, of travel for all the, whole, all the, all the territory, French territory. You have here uh, uh, some uh, municipalities which are uh, attracting a lot, a lot of uh, of uh, of travel. So here you have two information. One is the distance traveled by capita on the left, and on the right you have the distance traveled by municipality. As as in Paris, you have a lot of people and a lot of public transport. You you are, as you can see in Paris, the capital, we have very few uh, distance traveled by by people by people in uh, what, whatever the transportation system will be. But in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, on, the, on the opposite, if, as people are going far from Paris, they, they will, they, the, the, the distance driven by municipality is uh, longer in Paris. So this is one of the three inputs. I will go quickly for the other one. We need to know uh, the, the, how many... Uh, uh, how five many, five how many minutes, cars? Christophe. Five minutes, okay. We need to know how many uh, cars will be in each municipality. So you have here the two, two scenarios in 2035 where you can see for each municipality of the Paris area, uh, what is the density of, uh, of, uh, of the electrical fleet. So I go quickly. Now we go to the, char the for the charging system. We have also some assumption. I will give you the results. Two, city, two municipalities, which are not very far, which are known, which are Paris and Versailles. Paris uh, is a 25 uh, bigger than Versailles, but still uh, you can see two things. One is that the, big, the difference between the peak is not 25 uh, because, uh, uh, because, par because uh, of the people, of the effect that I mentioned uh, of the, of the um, gravity-based system. And, and, and the, sh the shape is, is different. In Paris, the peak is reached in, at uh, 9.30 uh, when people arrive at work. And in Versailles, it is at the, uh, in the middle and at the end of the day. So, so this is important for designing a, 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 a grid. Uh, and now I go uh, to my conclusion and to see what is the impact on the, on the, um, on the French uh, um, uh, I forget the name, French uh, substations, pardon me. Uh, uh, so high, high voltage uh, uh, substation. You can see that uh, you have here in the dark red the 
the substation where the peak is higher than, than, than six percent of the what it is today. So uh, you have on, only only out of the about 2,000 uh, substation, only 15 would face a peak higher than five percent, which is not a lot. And th so this is in the 1.2 uh, million scenario, and so which will happen in 2023. So I think uh, we have in, in four years enough time to upgrade uh, these 15 substations. So this is not an issue for, for that. The question is, will it be an issue for 2020, uh, 2035, where we will have 12 million substations? You have, of course, you have more substations in, in red, which, is, which are uh, uh, the one who are the most loaded. But if we get more, a little bit more in depth, we can see, uh, so this is a distribution of in 2035, we can see that here we have uh, 600 above, uh, above uh, uh, 2%, two percent. We have only 20% of the substation with, a, with an increase of the, of the capacity higher than 10%. And uh, the message of Enedis and the distribution at, at least in France is that it is completely manageable to upgrade 20% of our substation to have uh, uh, an increase of capacity between uh, 10 and, uh, and 50%. And 50%. I have finished my presentation just to say, is to say that seen from the point of view of the substation in a real one, it is really possible to, uh, to manage this, this, uh, this uh, ambitious uh, system. Thank you. I am open to, 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 to any question. Okay, thank you, Christophe, for uh, this uh, very nice presentation uh, on time. We even have a, a bit more uh, time than needed, so it's perfect. Uh, so you have uh, two questions, uh, from one from uh, Joaquin Teron uh, Villalba. Uh, how is NAD is going to value the flexibility of the clients, uh, and mainly through early tariff, or are there is other methods currently under consideration? Me? Do you hear me? No, I can't hear you. You ask a question. Uh, yes, it's uh, the, the question on the on the Q and A. Okay. So uh, it's one question for from Joaquin. Uh, which is asking the, the question on the valuation of flexibility to the clients. Um, is it through early tariff or there is other methods which are under consideration in Enedis? We, we, we take uh, flexibility as an alternative. And so then uh, we have some assumptions for the cost of, uh, of moving from one, uh, from, uh, one uh, at one price for the other price. What is the impact on the on the, uh, on the of the of the tariff and then on, on the, the quantity, we we have some assumption, yes. Okay. Uh, another question from uh, Michael Grossman: uh, Does Enedis distinguish between slow, fast, super fast charging scenarios? And um, because uh, of course, uh, super fast or slow have a different impact on the local distribution grids. Of course, it says there will be an impact, uh, uh, but. Uh, we are here. My presentation is based on um, on, uh, on the substation level, which are connecting several connecting several chargers, uh, so slow chargers and uh, high, and uh, high level and uh, fast chargers. So of course there is a, there, there should be another calculation made for the rate of uh, development of lower level uh, voltage system. Okay, and then a question from uh, Maxime Jukenak Mellinger. Uh, are you taking into consideration in your forecast the possibility that more and more people are going to work uh, more time from home in the future, like we all did in the last uh, couple of weeks? Hey, good Most. question. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I was anticipating that. Uh, and we are all anticipating that. Of course, there will be an impact, but we don't. Uh, we, we, I've not yet computed it because we don't know what, what will be the issue of the present crisis. So we will wait a little bit to have more long-term view on what will happen. We are in 2035. In, 
I don't think in before 2022 there will be a significant amount of electric vehicles, so we can cope with that for the moment. But we, we are prepared to that. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christophe, for, for, the, for the answers. You're welcome. We are now uh, moving uh, to um, the, the last uh, presentation of, of this uh, webinar uh, from uh, Icaro Freitas Gomez. So please, Icaro, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Yannick, for the virtual floor. Um, well, what an honor to close, right, the session of this webinar here from the IAE. I would like to thank for the invitation. It, it has been all amazing, the discussion that we have here since the beginning. And uh, now I'm going to try to link what has been said about electric vehicles and the grid that has been told about Christophe, use emailing tariffs. Um, so, okay. Okay, so good morning everyone in Americas. Good afternoon for those in Europe and uh, in Africa and of course, good evening for those in Asia. My name is Icaro Freitas Gomez. I'm a PhD student um, in energy economics at Vedecon and in Central Subelec. And today, as I told you before, I'm gonna link what has been said about EVs and grids. So our main presentation today is about tariff design with electromobilities and um, DERs. DERs is standing for Distributed Energy Resources. So we're gonna see what are the economic principles applied when EVs are connected with them. Here we're gonna treat the insights from California due to data availability, but of course the results can be extended uh, to different places around the world. Um, so this is our outline, a uh, very basic outline, by the way. First of all, I'm gonna present VEDECAM, but I think that job has been tremendously done by the colleagues here from VEDECAM. Then I'm gonna tackle some introduction just to place the context of actual tariff design and um, EVs as well. Then I'm going to focus on the methodology of our work with input data, of course, the result, and then I'm going to wrap up all the presentation and the webinar seminar with some conclusions. Um, okay, Vedecom is a French IT decarbonized mobility research um, institute, as has been told uh, by Remy. So I'm going to tackle now the introduction and the context of our research. Well, first of all, we know very well from this presentation uh, that we have the two different industries that are suffering a uh, huge transformation. Uh, the automotive industry, by the way, uh, by the increase of electric vehicle sales, pushed by CO2 emission restrictions in big cities and subsidies, not only on direct sales, but as well in charge infrastructure. And we can see those two exponential curves. I mean, those two are good exponential curves, not the one that we see on the daily news, right? Um, because this one, they talk about um, the EVs uptake uh, for EV stocks. So from energy uh, EV outlook, we can see that, for example, um, in an optimistic scenario, we may have 150 million electric vehicles at the end of 2030. Of course, that was before the crisis, so maybe they'll change the number. And in a super high optimistic, we may have um, 250 million vehicles around 2030. This is a super optimistic, but anyway, it's still a scenario, and the electricity industry, it will have to cope with this uptake if it really happens. So what can be done? Um, for example, the electricity is facing their own challenges, which is the rapid air carbonization, when we have a lot of wind and solar being installed. And this, as we know very well, we have the problem of uh, intermittency. So we need to increase the flexibility to avoid some problems. And so, for example, one solution to that would be adopting batteries. In this case, stationary batteries. But moving on, in this case, are EVs a threat or not? Because in this context of decrease of electricity consumption, where we increase the energy efficiency, right? And the EVs can well contribute with a peak of uh, energy consumption. Okay, in this angle, it can be a threat, but on the other hand, it can also be an opportunity for flexibility sources. As we have the battery inside, we can use vehicle to grid techniques with the bidirectional charger in order to restart the energy from the battery back to the grid. So in the flexibility market, one question that we're gonna to try to answer here today is if EVs and batteries, they are competing or they are complementary here. And to link everything here, the DERs and electric vehicles, we have what we call the tariffs, right? Because we have to send the right price for users in order to cope with different scenarios. So what are the tariff main roles instead of electricity? They have to reflect users' total consumption in case of energy and demand. They need to recover utility costs, even for the DSO distributed system operator, um, for the investment that have been done to connect the facilities and the buildings. And they also need to avoid, for example, the cost shifting due to this power of death, which is mainly the cross subsidy that someone uh, who doesn't have PV photovoltaic, for example, will have to pay 
for the people that have the PV. And of course, we can push a specific type of distributed energy resources. For instance, a very classic example is the feeding tariffs with PV. So what are the existing tariff types? We're not going to dig deeper into this. We're just going to show how the tariff is actually designed around the world. We have three main parts, an energy part, a network, and taxes and levies. And then the network part is a bit more complex because we have to decompose that into several parts as well. So for the distribution case, we need to adapt the format, the temporal granularity, and the locational one. For the format, we can have fixed volumetric and capacity, the temporal one, flat and time of use, and for locational, the uniform around the territory, or we can have a new concept, it's called LMP, location and marginal price. Just for example, we're not going deep into this, but for example, in France, we have a more volumetric based tariff when we have time of use, on peak and off peak periods in the uniform around the country. In Netherlands, we have more capacity based tariff with a flat along the hours and uniform around the country. And in California Republic, okay, it's not a country, but sometimes they tend to think they are. I heard from themselves that. <laughs> but uh, we have the two different uh, kind of tariffs. We have a more volumetric one and more capacity one and the time of use as well. So for uh, think here is which are the best tariffs? We have a lot of options, but what are the best options here? I mean, the best thing to do is to put the cards on the table and show regulators what can be done with the different kinds of tariffs because the objectives in some countries are different. Um, the grid state, they are different. The people's behavior, they are different as well. So our objective here is to help them to decide according to their objectives. Okay, so a little fast example about the tariffs in California, for example, from South California Edison. We have a more capacity-based tariff and more energy-based tariff, as I told before. Those tariffs, there are three parts, indicating that we have the fixed capacity and energy, but the difference between them is the weight that we put in some parts. For instance, when you say capacity-based tariff is more capacity, kilowatt, the demand that is charged, and for energy-based tariff, kilowatt hour, the energy that is taken from the grid. And here, when we talk about time, for instance, we can see the different periods. For example, on peak periods, when we have here in the ancient time schedule, around midday this is very good for example push evs because we're going to charge higher when the ev is actually producing something and for the mailing countries we have the on peak period at the late afternoon early evening saying that okay i'm going to synchronize the on peak period when the grid is more constrained and then i'm going to attack the methodology first there was just a little bit of the context how to explain what tariffs are and the objectives and then our methodology in this research First of all, we're going to use two things here to access everything that we need. The DARCAM, which is a software from Berkeley Lab, we use to simulate investment in microgrids, and the avoided cost model, which is done by 3E uh, with the CPUC, the regulation of California, in order to assess which is the avoided cost for the grid once one kilowatt hour is exported or one kilowatt hour is not bought from the grid. This methodology was used by David Brown, which is also an EAE, EAE member, uh, and professor in Canada, University of Roberta. And we use this company model exactly to put the EVs on. So once we put that, we can compare different scenarios with different DERs to calculate charge and discharge strategies, demand reductions, net present value, avoided costs, cost shifting, and our EVs remuneration, which is a thing here that is also important that we need to, to know. Okay, our model here is very simple, which is a DERCAM model where we have a, just a cost function based on mixed integral linear programming, where we need to minimize the cost of electric cost, DERs, and the cost of EVs. This is just uh, the solar exports that, for example, if you don't want to use feeding tariffs, we just put this term to zero. And the main input parameters, here we have some loads from the Los Angeles area, talking about commercial and industrial sites with the, the specific load profile, which is very synchronized with PV. As you may know, many, many buildings, they have this exact load profile here. So how you model that? What is the methodology to do? The PV that we need for the first kind of investment, which is the exogenous one, where we need to fix the amount of TRs before. We're going to use the PV to offset 50% of the on-site consumption. The batteries, the exact amount to shave the peak uh, in the evening when there is low or no PV production. And for the AV, it's the same method used on the BSS, which is battery, but with the uh, constraint to the maximum power station or the user battery range needs. And for endogenous investment, which is okay, it's up to the model to decide the amounts of um, DERs installed. 
it's going to be to maximize private economic gain. So we don't have hand into this. We just let the model optimize it for us. And finally, the results, the results according to each type of investment, what can have been, what can we find from that? In first, the exogenous investment, we can see that concerning the average electricity cost changes, once we move the on peak periods to later on, we can see that we have a re we reduce considerably the electricity savings, meaning that the PV is not producing the same value that it was before, because when on peak periods are synchronized with the PV production, we have a lot of gains. And once we move, we shift this tariff to the on-peak period, which is later, the PV will not be synchronized anymore. So maybe we need some batteries or some storage capacity. And a curious thing here is, for example, when you have PV plus battery, or you have the scenario with PV, battery, and EV, they have similar results concerning electricity cost changes. But the problem is that, I mean, the solution is that at the second case, we have, char we have installed charging infrastructure. So we also help to decarbonize the mobility sector. And for the net present value, which is the private gains, for example, over the 20 years, which is the PV uh, lifetime, the new tariffs as a consequence of the cost changes in electricity, they will diminish the private gains. And energy tariffs, as we told before, uh, they have higher positive NPV in most of the cases, doing exactly to the high valuation of the PV. The PV doesn't contribute a lot to reduce the demand on the site, but instead of energy, they are very good. And so regarding the cost shifting, on the other hand, the capacity tariffs are better to that because they can increase the avoided system cost by uh, pushing the discharge of the batteries, for example, to the peak, to the time where the grid is more constrained and reduce the private saving. That's the problem of capacity-based tariffs because they do not induce, they do not push a lot of investments uh, on the facility side. And for endogenous investment, once you have the net present value calculated for this one, the highest possible NPV is when you have exactly the PV uh, generation during the on-peak time. So that's when the, the highest net present value that we can obtain. We're talking about just quantitative results here because uh, when we talk about quantitative, we have a lot of different tables and uh, it would be very tiring for all of us. Um, for the cost shifting, for example, the new tariff, when we push the on peak demand later on, exactly when the peak is constrained, we have the lowest cost shifting for the modules that we talked before for the exogenous investment. And finally, the finding for AVs, which are really interesting on my side. For example, they are fine in all the endogenous investments when we have coincidental tariffs applied. For example, I will charge this facility for the demand in uh, 6 p.m and showing high NPV and high uh, low cost shifting as well. So what does that mean? It means that the vehicle, they can offset uh, the demand from a facility during a short period of time, during a specific window. They are very efficient, even more than batteries. That's something to take into account. And the remuneration for bill management services, they can be higher as well into this type of tariff. Okay, coincidental yeah, tariff, they are- You have three minutes to conclude. Okay, perfect, thank you. So the thing is that, this kind of tariffs, the coincidental one, they can be very good, as we showed before with electric vehicles. But the problem is that once we put the coincidental tariff at 6 p.m., maybe they will create another peak elsewhere. For example, in this kind of building, they can create around 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., 9 a.m., sorry, when people are starting to arrive at the work. Uh, so that would be a huge problem for this kind of tariffs that uh, it may be avoidable. So moving on to the conclusion and to wrap up this presentation, um, as we told before, EVs, electric vehicles as distributed energy resources, they have helped to enhance private gains in the majority of cases. And um, the EVs can work together to support uh, the batteries and the facility grid. That's what we, we were talking before. And the cost shifting can be reduced with EVs, not only reduce the private gains, but also framing this very short uh, demand period uh, during these facilities. The EV stack remuneration, a good question to ask because all the aggregators want to know how much we can, um, we can earn, we can make from that. Okay, we found that they can vary between uh, 300, around 400 and 1200 dollars, uh, but this is the maximum repartition key. Uh, this is the maximum value. The repartition key from the, between the EV owner and uh, the facility building, it's up to them to decide. Um, so the remuneration, of course, can attract more users, but can have some competition and they cannibalize all the, the gains. So finally, moving with the policy recommendations that we're going to talk here, I want you to know that, okay, 
all this presentation was just to recommend to put the cards on the table and say to regulators, if you want to increase the private gains from people to invest in renewable energy, for example, we should put energy-based tariffs. If you want to reduce cost shifting, more capacity-based tariffs. And if you want to increase EVs remuneration, not only with the objective to push EVs forward, but anyway, we can use coincidental demand tariffs or even coincidental energy tariffs. Um, for future research, uh, for example, we need, for example, to analyze more buildings with higher demands and to verify the robustness because the more buildings we have to analyze, the more um, robustness we have from our results. So thank you very much. I will be really happy to answer some questions in the Q&A uh, section. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Icaro. Uh, we have um, two questions for you. One from uh, Pierre Odermatt. Uh, he's asking, what is the main energy pricing model for the customers who charge his vehicle by use or by a fixed, tariff, a fixed price? And are the business model of charging infrastructure managers uh, variable uh, or is there a, a public fund which is uh, required? Yeah, okay, first of all, um, the business model adopted here as uh, the facility, the building, they don't own the electric vehicle. The electric vehicle is, uh, they have an owner and they're going to charge at home. So as we know, more than 90% of the charging happens at home. And then once they charge at the fixed price, uh, they don't have any demand at home. They charge in a completely off-peak period. They bring this electric car to the grid in order to be discharged or charged with the PV um, energy. And so the model will optimize this charging and discharging stations. So the cost of electricity, the V2D um, charging station is another thing to ask because they are not completely in the market there. We have to compete, so we have to check some sources to gain that. And according to California SC, we have uh, rebates. We have rebates for a charging station for, um, uh, for installing the workplaces. So if you want to install a seven kilowatt um, charging station, bi-directional one, we have, for example, 50% of rebates on that. And so if you want to see the parameters, we have a lot of different parameters. Maybe we could uh, uh, send it later. And the question from uh, Xavier Moreau, uh, Icaro, the model optimized the PV or set it's at 50% of the annual consumption? Okay, yeah, first we have the two different um, investments. In the exogenous investment, um, we offset 50% of the annual consumption with the PV, and then we have the fixed amount of PV installed. And in the exogenous one, which is the second one, is up to the model to decide how much of the PV they're going to install. And so if you've said 20%, 30%, it's up to the model to decide based on the, the cost function that we need to um, minimize. Okay. Uh, is there some uh, question from uh, the panelists uh, to each other or to, um, uh, to Igaro or, or so? We are uh, reaching the end of the, of the session. It's the time to raise the, the burning questions that you have uh, in the back of your mind. So no burning question? Yes, so I, I, I have a small one if you are uh, me, Mr. President. Pleasure. Uh, um, I, I'm very happy of the different uh, quality of the different topic addressed today because this, this, these uh, topics are very uh, complementary from each other. And, uh, but the idea is that, um, that I would like to express is the fact that we have mentioned the, the, name, the word remuneration. And there is a risk, there is an issue of uh, remuneration sharing between different stakeholders in the, in the system. Uh, we have uh, some who are in the public area, like, uh, like uh, the distribution and the, the grid, some are in the public, some are in the private. And uh, so we are talking of of maybe some time uh, uh, developing subsidies, and there is a risk of cross subsidies. Those who are the richer with, car, with a big Tesla car could have the best car and uh, paid by the other one. So uh, th this is an issue which has not been addressed today, but which is very important and which uh, should be taken into account when we make that, because we have different, different profile, I would say, of uh, stakeholders. And I think it's uh, important to have it in mind to avoid any free, free riders uh, anywhere. But you know, just a comment, maybe a com comment from the other, from the rest of the panel. 
Uh, Icaro, is your model uh, taking into account the different size of the EVs? Because in fact, the larger the battery, the richer the people. Yeah, exactly. We did some research of the mostly bought in the California uh, station, for example, and we take the five most uh, apparent EVs and then we do an average for this battery. And we arrive at the conclusion of 58 kilowatt hours of the battery. And of course, we can use 100 like a Tesla, but not everybody has a Tesla. So when doing this averaging, we can have an average electric vehicle capacity for the battery. Yeah, nothing against Tesla, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is a, a question uh, from Michael. Does the modeling account for the possibility of vehicle owner to sell a power storage service to the DSO? In fact, we just include one type of service, which is the energy arbitrage uh, and the demand reduction. And, but in this case, the aggregator is the owner, is the building, sorry, is the only building facility. We don't have any extra ancillary services to the grid, to the DSO, to the TSO. Uh, of course, we can have, we can stack many, many services, but our main here was to analyze this kind of service, which is energy arbitrage plus demand reduction from the side. Uh, we have also a question for uh, Christophe uh, from uh, Anne-Juliette Den. Um, how did you come about with the different scenarios uh, in order to obtain your forecast on the future of French electricity demand? And uh, a general question uh, that I've been raised a couple of times, uh, can we have access to the slides after the session? Uh, I think uh, the IAEA will answer to the, the question at the end. I think this uh, record will be accessible to those who are members of the association. Uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, the, um, for, for the demand, uh, well, I, I, could, I forgot the beginning of the question. Uh, uh, how did you come about with the different scenarios uh, and on what grounds to, in order to obtain the forecast on the future of France electricity demand? Uh, electricity demand is coming from uh, many, many uh, topics, and uh, I have precisely explained at the beginning that the peak load is not, com not only coming from uh, the electric vehicle, but also, for, also from other uh, sectors, which are changing and which will be more, even more changing after the COVID crisis. So, uh, and so, so we have to make a global, very much detailed assumption of uh, the growth of each uh, use of electricity. And, and, uh, and so with this kind of assumption and with a target, which is uh, uh, we have a variable, we have a, an adjustment which is coming from the, the, the amount of vehicles which, which will be existing in France in 2035. The government intends to add uh, 15 million vehicles to decarbonize the, the French economy. And so this is a, the target that we are addressing and, and we are checking the feasibility of uh, this, uh, this, this, this in our, in the energy grid. And it is okay, as I, as I said. I hope you, I answered the question. Anyway, I'm happy to have a que written question if, you, if, if necessary later. Okay. Uh, then a question to Emilia uh, from uh, Jaco Nell. Um, uh, would, would using a similar freight train, as I believe is used between France and the UK to transport EVs long distance, uh, be a possible uh, alternative to the induction highways? Yes, I, I think that might be an interesting alternative, of course, from the infrastructure point of view, as, as the train uh, railways are already there. So, so that's definitely an interesting alternative. Um, our, however, I, I would wonder if the capacity is quite sufficient yeah. uh, to be studied. Okay, and then there is a, a remark or a question from uh, Thomas Roilet uh, um, regarding a, a project uh, on the NSEM campus uh, that will provide some, uh, some real data. So I think it's more a question. It's more a, a point for uh, Icaro, but I'm I'm not sure. Yes, Emilia. Oops, yes. Um. If if that's the project with uh, L2P uh, laboratory in Lille, uh, we 
actually have a PhD student called uh, Yasin Sahimi who's working there, and uh, and we've seen a presentation of the of the system they have there uh, for monitoring the, uh, the the EVs and renewable energy in the system. But uh, I'll I'll try to look into that again. Okay. So the question was for uh, for Icaro. So uh, it seems that uh, some people are really to are happy to share data with you uh, about. Uh, uh, um, battery fixed and uh, rolling batteries uh, to to put some French numbers uh, and values in your in your model because it's a it's a U.S. model so far because there is more data on the U.S. than uh, elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much for the the consideration, Thomas. Yeah, yeah. Of course, if you have some French data to use in the model, so we can touch how the European and the French sector can work. But uh, yeah, as we've done before with the California data, maybe we can extract some values for Europe, some lessons as well. But if you have the French one, even better. Okay, uh, so uh, I think we are reaching the end of this uh, webinar. Uh, I will uh, give the floor uh, to uh, David Williams, I guess, for the last words uh, uh, coming from the IED. Thank you, Yannick. Uh, IAEE wishes to thank Yannick Perez and our distinguished panelists for an outstanding webinar. I know I personally learned quite a bit uh, through this and uh, I'm very, very grateful for, uh, for all of your presentations. As uh, Christoph had mentioned, yes, uh, the webinar will be archived on IAEE's website where you can view um, the PowerPoint presentations that have been presented as well as uh, listen to the uh, uh, the webinar again or to pass on to your friends and colleagues. You do need to be a member to view uh, and, and that is behind our member wall. Uh, so thank you once again Yannick and team. We much appreciate this and I officially close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>